So I've been a football coach here in the UK for almost 30 years now. Once upon a time, I had a decent shot at playing at a professional level, and I even had trials at Man City when I was a teenager. This is before they had the oil money. I don't think I've gotten a sniff these days. But like so many others, a horrible injury took me out of the picture, and I had to kiss my dreams goodbye. However, that didn't mean that I had to turn my back on football altogether. It's my life, always has been, so I decided to get into a career in coaching instead. A few years later, I'm working for Marine AFC on Merseyside, mainly along a bloke that had to be double my age. He had bags upon bags, loads more experience, and bags load more contacts, and one day, he comes to me with the offer of a lifetime. An old mate of his had somehow managed to land the head coaching job for the national women's team of Belize. Trouble was, he needed two blokes to help him out. He'd asked his mate, who had in turn asked me. Eight weeks after that, following all kinds of vaccinations and travel forms, we were flying out to Belize City to become the official coaching staff of an actual national team. Granted, they just so happened to have never played a game before, but we saw that as more of a challenge than a hindrance. But the trip turned out to be much more difficult than just coaching a few amateur footballers. In fact, it turned out to be a bloody nightmare for the entire time we were there. First off, and this isn't all that connected to the Belize thing, but our flights out to Belize City happened to be on the 9th of September of 2001. So we spent our second full day in Belize, not maxing and relaxing by the pool as we should have been, but glued to the telly in the hotel bar, watching footage of the planes smashing into for hours, and if our flights had been booked two days later, we'd have been in the air during one of the most terrible events of our lifetime. So to say that shook us up would be an understatement of the century. Anyways, the main thing happened about two or three weeks later once we'd gotten to the swing of the coaching job. Me and my colleague from Marine were staying in the fairly scabby hotel in Belize City, but the food and the drink were absolutely phenomenal, and it was all being paid for by Football Federation of Belize, so it wasn't like beggars were about to suddenly become choosers. The only trouble was that it could get a bit wild later on at night. I saw more than one older European-looking bloke going into a room with a much more attractive Belizean girl than leaving maybe half an hour to an hour later. Sleazy, I know, but as long as they didn't put him near us, we weren't fussed. And only a few weeks into staying there, I'm woken up in the middle of the night by a repeated rhythmic bang on the wall near my headboard. Instantly I know what's going on, and it only makes me extra nauseous when I can hear some deep voice in American accent shouting all these pervy things. God help the girl he was with. I remember thinking because she just stayed quiet as a mouse the whole time and in the end, I ended up banging on the wall back and shouting, keep it down pal, or something of the sort. He does oblige a bit, not stopping but at least slowing the temple while keeping his voice down. Still grim, but better than nothing I suppose. The next morning, I get a knock on the door and it's the Belize police wanting to ask me a few questions. Of course, I oblige following the officer into the corridor and that's when I see all the blood on the door of the room next to me. There are bloody handprints on the door, blood all over the doorknob, and bloody footprints leading away from it. The mad thing is though, that would have all been cordoned off with tape in Britain, but the cops there just didn't seem to mind us contaminating the scene by standing right next to it. As it turned out, what I've been listening to wasn't just, you know, that. The bloke had strangled some poor girl before doing that to her body, just feet away from where I'd been trying to sleep. You can bet we move hotels after that. About a month later, our women's team took on their Guatemalan counterparts in their first ever international football match. We got smashed, 12-0. Two days later, after we played El Salvador and the results were much better, we only got beat by six goals to nil. The president of the FFB sacked us after our post-match team talk. We tried explaining that having the number of goals that we were beaten by was actually quite an achievement for a brand new team. He didn't give a monkey's bare bottom. He just wanted wins, so we were out. We flew back to the UK in time for all the Christmas hype and I just remember spending it trying to forget about the murder. The whole thing was 
Definitely one of the most surreal times of my life. And if it wasn't for the actual murder that I tried to sleep through, I'd definitely do it all again tomorrow. During my gap year, I decided to stop off in Myanmar, Burma, for a few weeks. They just opened up to tourism for the first time in about 40 years, which really offered a chance to blaze the trail, so to speak. And the exchange rate was such that I could extend my trip by about two to three weeks if I took advantage of the country's weak currency. I ended up getting a pretty decent little hotel in Yangon, and at a rate that was a third of what I'd have paid back in Bangkok or Chiang Mai. The only obvious downside was that the hotel was having maintenance being performed on a couple of the floors, so they mentioned that it might be a little bit noisy overnight. I did think it was a bit stupid that they'd be doing DIY in the middle of the night, but at a nightly rate of about two bucks, I was hardly about to freak out over it. Anyway, I have a great night's sleep. The bed was great, the bathroom the same. Then I head down to breakfast. That's when I get talking to this pair of Spanish hippie types who tell me they'd been awoken in the middle of the night by the maintenance men who'd apologized and told them that they'd have to vacate because they were about to de-louse the room with gas. And no sooner had they said that had there seemed to be a bit of commotion in the hotel lobby. It was a girl speaking French to a receptionist. I had no idea what she was saying but it seemed quite urgent and the girl was obviously frustrated that no one could understand her. I didn't think much of it as I headed out into the streets to explore Yangon. The heat and humidity really got to me that first day, so after picking up a few pieces of rather exotic looking fruit from a marketplace, I wandered back to the hotel to take a nap. But when I arrive, I'm greeted by the sight of what was obviously some kind of ambulance, along with the French girl sitting on the hotel steps, crying her eyes out. It turned out that there had been a miscommunication between the maintenance men and the hotel staff, and as a result, they'd pump gas into a room that had a traveler staying in it. They'd been suffocated in their sleep, having gone to sleep all comfy that previous night, totally unaware that they'd never wake up again. I didn't find out who the person was or where they were from. I just saw the body bag being wheeled out of the lobby and into the ambulance, and by that point it was obvious that they wouldn't be going to the hospital, more like the coroner. I checked out of the hotel the same day, and only spent a week longer in Burma before flying over to Thailand. I just don't think that they were ready to accept tourists at that stage. They just weren't accustomed to visitors in the same way that the Thais or the Vietnamese are. And as much as I tried to just enjoy the rest of my trip, it was something that definitely cast a long shadow over it. I just feel so terrible for whoever was in that room. Having gone to some strange new place to learn and grow as a person, only to be killed by someone's pure and absolute negligence. My mom travels a lot as part of her job, so she stays in a whole bunch of different hotels. She's on short flight from New York City to Toronto and she gets talking to a guy who's in a similar kind of job only he's actually from Toronto and had been visiting Manhattan on business. Mom thinks she can swoop in and undercut the deal he was getting, earning a bunch of kudos from her bosses in the process, so she gives this guy her business card and tells him to call her. They land, and they say goodbye, and my mom heads off to her hotel for the evening. A few hours later, she's almost ready for bed when she gets a call from the hotel lobby saying my dad was there to surprise her and would it be okay if they gave him a copy of her room key. Mom hadn't been expecting him and the way she tells it, she was actually kind of angry that he'd apparently left a six-year-old me with a sitter when I'd just gotten over chicken pox. So, she calls to be like, what are you doing, Paul? Only, my dad has no idea what she's talking about. He was at home, taking care of me, and she could even hear me over the line to confirm it. She tells dad she'll call him back and then heads down to the lobby to see what in the world is going on. And who should it be, waiting in the lobby, pretending to be my dad? The guy she gave the business card to. As you can imagine, she was both freaked out and very angry, but she calmly explains to the concierge that the guy was not her husband, and that if he turned up again, 
he was to call the cops. The guy tried to play all innocent, acting like he'd just picked up the wrong vibes from her or whatever. But he could have called her. He could have asked the reception to call her. There were a million different things he could have done if he thought she was just looking for some little work trip affair. But she didn't do any of that. He just tried to talk his way into getting himself a freaking room key, presumably hoping he could catch my mom sleeping. Obviously, my mom was in no mood to sleep after the little encounter and she remembers that she has a copy of this guy's business card too. She couldn't exactly call the cops and the guy since he hadn't actually committed any crime, but she could contact the company he worked for to maybe get him fired for being such a creep. But when she calls the number on the card, she discovers it's a dead number, and the company that's listed on the card that she eventually was able to get a hold of never heard of the guy in question. The guy gave her a fake card, presumably just to get hers. He was never in the same business as her, but the fact that he managed to talk a good enough game to convince her is incredibly creepy to me. Like there's only one thing scarier than an evil psychopathic predator, and that's a smart one. Luckily, my mom was able to fly back the following afternoon after her business meeting, but it was definitely a close call, and I thank God she was able to get away safely. Back in the early 2000s, I had to fly out to Regina, Saskatchewan for a marketing conference. I was an entry-level employee at quite a big company, but they had agreed to pay my hotel bills if I found somewhere within a specific budget. As you can imagine, they ended up lowballing me pretty hard, but I still managed to find a fairly nice bed and breakfast type deal that seemed to be this little mom and pop operation. I fly out, check in, take a shower, and then I'm air drying while sorting out my outfit for the next day when I get a knock on the room's door. The whole thing was basically just a converted residential unit, so there were no phones in the rooms or anything but I'm also in no position to answer the door, so I just call out to whoever it was, like, yes, is everything okay? I just hear the voice of the owner on the other side say, can you put on some clothes? Thank you. They weren't rude or sleazy about it, and the thank you on the end was very polite, but nevertheless, I'm stood there, still as a stone, thinking, what in God's name? I immediately throw a towel around myself, locking the door, throwing all my stuff back into my travel case. Then I walked right out of that B&B, booked myself into the Ramada Plaza, and immediately called the cops. If you can believe it, the guy denied filming me, spying on me, or anything of the sort, then had the gall to complain that I'd walked out without paying my bill. I told the cops to ask him how he knew that I was naked in a private hotel room. They said that they'd let me know what the next steps were. Surprisingly, there were none. All of a sudden, the guy didn't seem all that interested in collecting on the bill. He was too busy explaining the cassette tapes in his office that showed naked images of literally hundreds of his guests. Not 100% sure what happened to the guy after that, but I'm hoping he at least lost his hotel license or did some prison time. It's one thing to record people without their consent, Another thing entirely to be so brazen about it. I hope that creep gets hit by a bus. During the year 1887, construction began on a two-story, mixed-use building in the city of Chicago. Five years later, the owner told investors and suppliers that he intended to add a third floor one designed to serve as a hotel to the many tourists due to descend into the city for the upcoming World's Columbian Exposition. Celebrating the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's arrival in the New World, the exposition was an influential social and cultural event that had a keen effect on Chicago's architecture, sanitation, and arts. The exposition would further secure Chicago's reputation as America's second city, and the hotel was named to reflect that, becoming the World's Fair Hotel. However, the World's Fair Hotel would become infamous for another reason entirely. Instead of accommodating visitors from across the world, many of the hotel's rooms would house nothing but pain, 
suffering, and death, eventually taking on a new name, Chicago's Murder Castle. Herman Webster Mudgett was born on May 16th of 1861 in Gilmanton, New Hampshire. His genealogy showed that he was descended from some of the earliest English settlers to arrive in North America. Being born into a farming family, Herman would often help his father in his duties as a farmer, trader, and house painter. By all accounts, he was a polite and well-adjusted young man who gave no hints of the person that he would grow up to be. After graduating from Phillips Exeter Academy, Herman entered the University of Michigan's Department of Medicine and Surgery, graduating in June of 1884 after passing his exams. He then traveled back to his native New Hampshire to become the apprentice of Dr. Newham White, a high vocal advocate of human dissection. It's here that Mudgett spent almost all of every day in the company of White, helping him cut up hundreds of human corpses in order to find out exactly what had killed them. It's here that Herman's behavior seemed to take a distinct turn for the worse, as housemates noted that he treated his young wife in an abominable manner. She returned to New Hampshire shortly afterwards, and it appears the couple maintained little contact following their separation. Without his marriage tying him to any one particular place, Herman decided to move to Moore's Forks in New York State in the hopes of opening a medical practice there. Shortly after the move, a young boy went missing, one that was said to be last seen in the presence of Herman Mudgett. Naturally, Herman protested his innocence and the local police force seemed to have taken him at his word, as no formal investigation was opened. However, rumors of his involvement in the child's disappearance stuck, and Herman was forced to leave town to protect himself from vigilante reprisals. Herman opted to move to Philadelphia, where he got a job at a drugstore. Yet it was during his employment that a small child died after taking medicine purchased at the store. This time, police launched a full investigation, and despite once again protesting his innocence, Herman found himself as the case's number one suspect. Again, Herman decided to flee rather than face a false conviction, this time heading for the windy city of Chicago. But in order to avoid any association with the vicious rumors and misfortune that might follow him into the Midwest, Herman decided to change his name. And so, in August of 1886, Herman Mudgett arrived in Chicago, only this time, he was calling himself Henry Howard Holmes, or more commonly known as H.H. H. Holmes. Upon an initial exploration of Chicago's South Side, Holmes discovered a drugstore at the northwest corner of South Wallace Avenue and West 63rd Street in Englewood. The owner, Elizabeth S. Holton, offered Holmes a job and he proved to be a hard-working and diligent employee, so much so that it wasn't long before Holmes made her a cash offer for ownership of the store. It was one that was far too generous to refuse, and since Holmes had actually attended Michigan University with Lizzie Holton's husband, they were only too happy to sell. Shortly after, Holmes began construction of the World's Fair Hotel. The ground floor was half shop front and half hotel lobby, exactly the kind of thing you'd expect from such upmarket accommodation. Yet the second floor was anything but comfortable or cozy, with its design and construction hinting that Holmes might well have been guilty of the child murders he'd been accused of. Because Holmes wasn't constructing a hotel, he was creating something akin to a human slaughterhouse. While the third floor of the hotel did indeed host a number of comfortable apartments, the second floor of the World's Fair Hotel consisted of a number of elaborate torture rooms. All of the doors and some of the steps were connected to an intricate alarm system. Whenever someone stepped into the hall or headed downstairs, a buzzer sounded in Holmes' bedroom. There were over a hundred windowless soundproofed rooms, 51 doorways which led to nowhere, and a maze of hallways, some of which seemed resulting in nothing but dead ends. Many of the rooms were outfitted with chutes that ran directly into the basement, where Holmes had installed acid vats, a vast quantity of quicklime, and a crematorium to dispose of his victims' bodies. The first of these victims would turn out to be a lover of his named Julia Smythe. She and her family had moved into the World's Fair Hotel after her husband secured himself a job in Holmes' pharmacy. But after her husband discovered the sordid tryst, he abandoned Julia and their young daughter, 
relinquishing custody of her and leaving his wife to continue her affairs with Holmes. To the outright observer, it seemed like H.H. H. Holmes had everything going for him. He was in the process of expanding an already successful business, and with the addition of Julia and her young daughter, he had something of a fledgling family to bring a familial satisfaction to match his financial success. But on Christmas Day of 1881, neighbors noticed that H.H. H. was alone for the holidays. When they inquired as to the whereabouts of his newfound paramour, H.H. H. broke down crying, telling them that Julia had died during a termination of her pregnancy and that her grieving daughter had been sent away to live with relatives. Shocked and sympathetic over his sudden bereavement, his neighbors asked no more questions of him, but it's more than likely that H.H. had subjected both mother and daughter to his preferred method of execution. He would administer a heavy dose of chloroform, then lock his victims in an improvised gas chamber on the second floor of the house. Once he was sure that his subject had expired, he'd simply toss them down the corpse tubes which ran into the basement's acid vats. What seems to set Holmes apart from many other serial killers is that Holmes applied an almost industrial process to his work. Other killers took pleasure in the process, often engaging in paraphilic acts of depravity, whereas Holmes seemed to prefer being as far removed from the nitty-gritty as possible. Yet despite his apparent squeamishness on account of rarely spilling blood, Holmes' anatomical knowledge gave Holmes a rather unusual opportunity to profit from his murders. Given that he had extensive contacts in the medical profession, Holmes was actually able to sell the skeletal remains of his victims to colleges and medical labs. But such butchery made for a lot of work, and if theories of his squeamishness are to be believed, it only made sense for him to hire a sort of assistant who would aid him in his detestable labors. This is how H.H. H. Holmes met a man named Benjamin Peitzel. Benjamin was a carpenter by trade, but one with a rich and varied criminal past. Somehow Holmes convinced Benjamin to assist him in his murderous rampage, with one district attorney later called him his creature, the Igor to Holmes's Dr. Frankenstein. Yet the pair didn't exclusively engage in violent activity together. They also plotted several less violent criminal enterprises, one of which was a plot to fake Benjamin's death. Swayed by the prospect of collecting on the $10,000 life insurance policy, the scheme would involve Peitzel posing as a wealthy inventor named B.F. Perry. This Perry character would take out a lucrative policy, then die in a tragic laboratory explosion which would conveniently leave his corpse as a charred, unrecognizable mess. All H.H. had to do was find a corpse that was roughly the same height and weight as his crooked companion, then go about suitably disfiguring it. But Holmes had a better idea. He believed the life insurance policy would be much easier to claim on if they used the body of the real B.F. Perry, which meant a death sentence for Peitzel. Soon after, he was knocked unconscious, covered in benzene, and set alight while he was still alive. His suffering must have been agonizing. Locked away in one of the World Fair Hotel's vaults, screams soaked up by the soundproof padding that lined the exterior of the room, burning and burning until his life went up in smoke. Given he had the actual corpse of the fictional B.F. Perry, H.H. H. easily collected on the fraudulent insurance payout. But by that point, Holmes had manipulated Benjamin Peitzel's wife so heavily that he was not only able to convince her to split the money with him, but he also convinced her to allow three of her five children to live with him in the World's Fair Hotel. One night, two of the girls were awoken by Holmes, who instructed them to follow him into a vacant room. There, Holmes forced the two girls to climb into a large leather storage trunk, one which he'd cut a small hole into. Once it was sealed up, he attached a gas line to the hole filled the trunk with lighting gas until both had turned blue from asphyxiation. He then buried the two girls' bodies in his basement, another two additions to his already sizable body count. Bizarrely, Holmes' downfall was rooted in a stolen horse. Down in Texas, a former cellmate of his had an axe to grind, for it was he that devised the life insurance scam H.H. H. later used on Benjamin Peitzel. 
Holmes had promised him $500 to buy the idea from him, but never paid up. And once word reached Texas that a rather devious individual had enacted such a scheme, the erstwhile cellmate was furious. In revenge, the man told Texan authorities all he knew of Holmes' malevolence, hoping it would be enough to land his former Selly back in prison. While initially the authorities had little evidence with which to convict Holmes, they did have an outstanding warrant for stealing a horse, and it was just enough to get him extradited. Texas law enforcement then sought the help of their northern counterparts, who were only too happy to assist them given the increasing number of suspicious disappearances that seemed to orbit H.H. wherever he went. Chicago police were particularly concerned after two of their officers stumbled into the second floor of the hotel while H.H. was absent. Naturally, H.H. kept all incriminating evidence behind locked doors, so the officers weren't able to find anything too harrowing. But the endless corridors, false doors, and staircases which led to nowhere all gave the officers the impression that something very unusual and very wrong was happening in the World's Fair Hotel, and that its quiet entrepreneurial owner wasn't quite all he appeared to be. H.H. was eventually apprehended up in Boston, having been tracked down by the Pinkerton Detective Agency. He was held on the horse theft warrant from Texas, which authorities swooped in on as many properties to perform rigorous searches. However, before they could return to the World's Fair Hotel, it mysteriously burned down, destroying most of the evidence with it. H.H. had been in Boston at the time of the arson and his ghoulish assistant Benjamin had long since passed. So there's no doubt that even towards the end, even when he was on the run, H.H. Holmes still had one pawn in the game one that was loyal enough to destroy the hotel before the depth of his depravity could be discovered. In October 1895, Holmes was put on trial for the murder of Benjamin Peitzel. By then, it was evident Holmes had also murdered the two of the missing Peitzel children and was responsible for many other disappearances. A jury of his peers took mere hours to convict him, before a judge wasted no time in sentencing him to death by hanging. I was born with the devil in me, Holmes would explain in the days before his execution. I could not help the fact that I was a murderer, no more than the poet can help the inspiration to sing. H.H.'s last request was to be buried ten feet under and encased in concrete, because he did not want grave robbers to exhume and later dissect his body, as he had done to so many others. It's also widely reported that Holmes believed that given the magnitude of his evil deeds, he was quite literally turning into Satan himself. In light of that, there's a good chance that Holmes believed himself to be some kind of supernatural monster, one that would not be contained by a regular human burial. Despite being somewhat odd, the request was granted in the end. On May 7th of 1896, Holmes was hanged at the Philadelphia County Prison, and perhaps it's fitting that his death was just as painful and violent as his life had been. You see, H.H.'s neck did not break on the drop as it was supposed to. Instead, he strangled to death slowly, twitching over a quarter of an hour before being pronounced dead a whole twenty minutes after the trap had been sprung. It's probably one of the few pieces of solace we get from the story of H.H. H. Holmes, knowing he spent his final moments in the same kind of terrified agony that most of his victims had suffered. But even in death, the world would never be truly rid of the man who called himself Henry Howard Holmes. Not only have his misdeeds passed into legend, as he regularly makes the top 10 worst serial killer lists whenever they should arise, but almost 140 years after his spree, the rights to books and biographies detailing his life are being bought up by TV and movie companies. And if there really is a hell, an old H.H. is looking up to see his image still terrorizing Americans. All this time later, it might well curl his lips into a wicked but satisfied smile. On 620 South Main Street of Los Angeles, California, sits a rather unassuming looking hotel. Opened on December 20th of 1924, the 19-story, 700-room hotel had recently undergone something of a makeover. 
It's now known as the Stay on Main and has been undergoing renovations for the last few years and is due to open again in October of 2021. But whether or not the hotel will see many bookings is anyone's guess as the place has, shall we say, a rather dark past. You see, for almost a hundred years, the Stay on Main was known as the Cecil Hotel, and it's most famous for being the site of an inordinate number of murders, people taking their own lives, and otherwise unexplainable deaths. In the early 1920s, American hoteliers William Hanner, Charles Dix, and Robert Shops pulled together their capital and opened the Cecil as ideal accommodation for travelers and tourists alike. Designed and constructed in the Boo art style, the hotel boasted an opulent marble lobby with stained glass windows, potted palms, and alabaster statuary. Each of the hoteliers brought a vast amount of business acumen to the table, and it seemed the Cecil was destined to be a roaring success. But within five years of its grand opening, America would plunge into financial ruin, as Wall Street would bring one of the darkest days in U.S. stock market history. It's a little surprise that this tumultuous event is the thing that seems to have preceded such a morbid decline, but even for such a depressing period of history, the Cecil seems to have been the center of some kind of grim maelstrom, as the deaths came thick and fast from then on. In November of 1931, 46-year-old W.K. Norton took his own life by ingesting poison. A week prior, he had checked into the Cecil under the guise of a man named James Willies from Chicago. It's not certain why Norton took his own life, but it's been commonly speculated that it was related to the financial crisis of the previous two years. Less than a year later, in September of 1932, 25-year-old Benjamin Dodditch shot himself in the head while sitting on a Cecil hotel bed. A maid found his body the following morning, but again, it's not clear why the young man decided to take his own life as he neglected to leave a note. In late July of 1934, former Army Medical Corps Sergeant Louis D. Borden checked into a room at the Cecil, only to slash his own throat with a straight razor in the hotel bathroom. Yet unlike the previous two, the 53-year-old left several notes, one of which cited poor health as the reason for his actions. A tragic yet perfectly understandable reason to take your own life, but just as terrifying and bizarre was that he too should gravitate to the Cecil in the final hours of his life. In the decade that followed, many more of these unexplained deaths would occur, around a third of them involving military men. But the nature of the deaths at the Cecil would not evolve until September of 1944, when a young woman named Dorothy Jean Purcell seemed to be overcome with a temporary but terrible madness. Dorothy had booked a stay at the Cecil with her 38-year-old boyfriend, Ben Levine. All was well until the middle of the night when Dorothy awoke in terrible pain. She soon realized that what she was experiencing was contractions and that she was going into labor. Terrified and confused, she dragged herself into the hotel bathroom, quietly giving birth to a tiny baby boy. Dorothy later claimed that she had no idea she was even pregnant and as such, she'd done absolutely no research into what to expect. According to her, the baby was silent as the grave, leading her to believe that it was some kind of stillbirth. Yet, instead of waking her boyfriend or calling for help, Dorothy Purcell opened up the bathroom window as quietly as she could, then tossed her infant son out into the night. The deceased child was later found on the roof of an adjacent building, yet it was determined that the child had still been alive at the time it had been thrown from the hotel window. Naturally, there was a palpable level of public outrage once the story graced local newspapers and Dorothy Purcell was tracked down and arrested on suspicion of murder. However, after being psychoanalyzed by not one, but three psychiatrists, Dorothy was determined to be mentally confused at the time of the birth and was acquitted in January of 1945 by reason of insanity. By all accounts, she'd had no history of mental health problems prior to checking into the Cecil, and had absolutely no explanation for the event itself. It seems like a horrible coincidence that such a thing would occur while staying at the Cecil Hotel, but the question remains, 
Were there other forces at work which induced both Dorothy's labor and the so-called confused state that followed? Between 1944 and 1962, a handful of other people took their own lives at the Cecil Hotel, all of them involving death by falling. One of these was particularly gruesome, given that it didn't just take one life, but two. On October 12th of 1962, 27-year-old Pauline Otten jumped from the window of her ninth floor room after an argument with her estranged husband, Dewey, who had stormed out of the suite just moments before. In a sickening twist of fate, Pauline landed on a passing pedestrian, 65-year-old George Giannini, with the impact killing them both instantly. As there were no witnesses, police initially believed that Pauline and George had taken their life together, possibly as some kind of bizarre death pact. However, it was soon determined that not only was Giannini wearing shoes at the time of his death, he also had his hands in his pockets. Had he jumped, his shoes would have likely fallen off during the fall or upon impact, and his hands would have definitely not have remained in his pockets. It's quite incredible that such an unfortunate event could even occur. There was literally not another soul on the street that day, and Pauline just so happened to land perfectly atop her unlikely victim. Again, is this purely coincidence, or was there something else at work that day? The next bizarre death to occur at the Cecil was that of 65-year-old retired telephone operator Goldie Osgood. Osgood was well known around the area and had earned the nickname of Pigeon Goldie because she fed birds in nearby Pershing Square. She was a regular sight around the square, perennially sporting the L.A. Dodgers baseball that she seemed to cherish so dearly. But on June 4th of 1964, a member of the Cecil's housekeeping staff entered Goldie's room to find the place had been ransacked. Birdseed was scattered all over the room, something Goldie carried around everywhere with her, and her beloved L.A. Dodgers cap was lying in a pool of blood just feet away from her lifeless corpse. She had been beaten, carnally violated, and then stabbed almost 30 times with a large serrated knife. Just hours after her murder, 29-year-old Jacques Ellinger was spotted walking through Pershing Square with his clothes absolutely soaked in blood. This is at a time when DNA analysis hadn't been invented yet, but since there was a literal trail of blood from Goldie's hotel room to Pershing Square, it was pretty easy to deduce that Jacques had been Goldie's killer. But this is where things get weird. Despite the killing being connected to a handful of other murders in the area, Jacques claimed that he had no memory of any murder and had in fact blacked out for a few hours, led to police dropping all charges against him. What should have been an open and shut case was muddied and crippled by some mysterious internal or external influence and once again, the Cecil Hotel was inextricably involved somehow. Two more mysterious deaths by falling occurred at the Cecil in the years 1975 and 1992. But perhaps the most famous of all the Cecil's enigmatic deaths is that of 21-year-old Canadian college student Elisa Lamb. Enrolled at the University of British Columbia, Elisa decided to do a post-Christmas trip down to California in early 2013. She traveled solo via Amtrak and inner-city buses, taking time out to visit the San Diego Zoo and eventually arriving safely in L.A. on January 26th. Two days later, she checked into the Cecil Hotel, opting for one of the hotel's cheaper shared rooms on its fifth floor. However, just a day or two into her stay, her impromptu roommates began to complain that Elisa was exhibiting some rather off behavior. As a result, hotel staff decided to move Elisa into her own private room at no extra cost. It's worth noting at this stage that Elisa had been previously diagnosed with both depression and bipolar disorder and was taking four separate medications to combat the symptoms. However, not a single member of her family said that she had any history whatsoever of any thoughts of taking her own life. According to them, Elisa had her own struggles but she determined to conquer adversity and lead a happy, productive life. Yet they did admit to one incident in which Elisa had gone missing for a brief period of time. Naturally, her parents were mildly concerned about her well-being during a solo trip down to Cali and asked Elisa to check in with them every day she was there. Elisa was only too happy to comply and called daily to share travel stories and swap I love yous. 
However, on February 1st of 2013, the very same day she was due to check out of the Cecil, her daily phone call didn't come. Elisa's parents grew increasingly worried until eventually they contacted the LAPD to report Elisa missing. Police jumped into action, driving down to the Cecil to question hotel staff. A number of the housekeeping team had seen Elisa on the day she disappeared, reporting that she was alone and that nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Police also spoke to the manager of a nearby bookstore that Elisa frequented during her stay, who told them Elisa was outgoing, lively, and very friendly, talking about what books she was getting and whether or not what she was getting would be too heavy for her to carry around as she traveled. In short, it's clear that Elisa was suffering from poor mental health, at least during the morning anyway. As a follow-up, police searched the Cecil and the surrounding area as best they could, using sniffer dogs and helicopter support. But given that no foul play was suspected, the LAPD was unable to search the entire hotel, leaving one detective with the terrible feeling that they were just inches away from finding a girl that was in grave and mortal danger. On February 6th of 2013, a week after she was last spotted, the LAPD circulated flyers with Elisa's image and brought the case to the public's attention through local media outlets. Just over a week later, having still made no progress in the case, LAPD released footage of Lamb's last known sighting, taken from an elevator surveillance camera on February 1st. The roughly three-minute video shows a solitary Elisa making unusual movements and gestures while appearing to hide in the elevator. It also appears as if Elisa was trying to get the elevator car to move in order to escape from someone who was pursuing her. Some speculated that the bout of paranoia may have been the result of her ingesting some kind of party drug, such as MDMA, while others suggest her behavior was that of a textbook psychotic episode. Yet perhaps the most disturbing suggestion was from a self-proclaimed video editing expert who asserted that the CCTV footage had been tampered with before being released to the general public. Besides the obvious obscuring of the timestamp, this expert claimed that not only had parts of the footage been deliberately slowed down, but almost an entire 60 seconds of the footage had been erased. If this is true, it's fairly obvious why this might be done, and that's to protect the identity of someone who happened to appear in the video. Yet at the same time, could it be to protect the person responsible for Elisa's disappearance? 19 days after Elisa initially went missing, Guests at the Cecil Hotel began to complain of low water pressure in their faucets and showers. This was on top of existing complaints that there was a weird taste and color to the tap water. So in the morning of February 19th, a hotel maintenance worker took the stairs up to the hotel's roof intending to inspect the 4,000 gallon tanks that supplied the hotel's water. Three of the four tanks were completely clear of any debris or blockages, but upon opening the fourth, the maintenance worker let out a blood-curdling scream as he was faced with the bloated, decomposing body of none other than Elisa Lamb. Two days later, the LA coroner's office released a statement saying that the cause of Elisa's death was accidental drowning, adding that her bipolar disorder played a significant factor in her untimely demise. Although the clothes she'd been wearing in the elevator CCTV footage were found in the tank with her, she had apparently been stripped naked at some point, with a sand-like substance covering the parts of her body that weren't submerged in the water. This sand-like substance was never identified, and there remains intense speculation as to what it might have been. Analysis of Elisa's body showed that there was no evidence of physical trauma, carnal assault, or her taking her own life. Toxicology tests showed traces of the prescription medication she was using, along with a very small amount of alcohol, but no traces of other recreational drugs could be found in her bloodstream. The amount of prescription medication was found to be slightly less than the effective dose, yet experts believe this wasn't low enough to spark off any kind of psychotic episode and dismiss this as being to blame for Elisa's death. All of these details certainly make for an intensely morbid mystery. Perhaps one of the most confounding aspects of the case is just how Elisa got into the water tank in the first place. You see, most of the doors and staircases that led to the hotel's roof were supposedly locked at the time the young Canadian disappeared, and only members of staff have the passcodes and keys to these passages. 
Any attempt to force them would have triggered an alarm at the hotel front desk, maybe even a hotel-wide fire alarm if any of the entrances were fire doors. Surely it's entirely possible that the hotel's fire escape would allow her to reach the roof unimpeded, but sniffer dogs only followed her scent about halfway up the staircase, then indicated that she must have used an open window to scramble onto the roof instead of the door which was just feet away. On top of that, all four tanks were 4 by 8 foot cylinders propped up on concrete blocks, meaning there was no fixed access to them and hotel workers had to use a ladder to get a look at the water. Each was protected by heavy steel lids that would be extremely difficult to properly replace from within. Essentially, all of this pointed to the idea that someone, or something, had somehow killed Elisa and disposed of her body in the water tank, all without being detected by any of the hotel's security cameras. Of all the mysterious deaths that occurred at the Cecil Hotel, Elisa's gives us the most detailed and intimate look into what kind of fate might have befallen them. It's clear that over the years many of the hotel guests had suffered psychotic episodes or blackouts during their stays, and at a rate far higher than any other hotel in the country. And in spite of the fact that these deaths have been occurring for almost a hundred years, we're still no closer to offering up concrete explanations for their untimely demises. Perhaps all of the murders, people taking their own life, and enigmatic deaths have perfectly reasonable and logical explanations to them, explanations that modern science would quite easily have explained. But perhaps there's something more sinister at work here, that the truth behind the Cecil is more akin to Stephen King's The Shining than we'd ever be comfortable admitting to ourselves. This happened on my first trip over to Vegas in the early 2000s. I'm usually based in the UK, but my job in stage production means I sometimes spend long periods of time in the US, usually in New York, but occasionally in Las Vegas too. The Vegas jobs pay insanely well, and working there usually means flying over there in the off-season, then rehearsing until the tourism picks up again. Off-season in Vegas tends to be the summer months of June through August when the temperatures can reach the low 40s. Us Brits tend to fare poorly in anything above 30, so you can imagine what kind of state I was in when I first landed. I was insanely jet-lagged, sweating my bollocks off, and definitely a bit worse for the wear, thanks to all the cheap booze I'd gotten on the Delta flight, so I passed out almost as soon as I got to my hotel. A few hours later, I'm woken by the hotel reception, who tell me there's been a noise complaint filed against me. I actually thought I might have been dreaming at first. The whole accusation made absolutely no sense, and here's why. Given that it was the off-season, the hotel was practically deserted. I didn't think there was even a single other person on my floor, let alone someone in the next room over. And this is on top of the fact that I had been completely passed out for the previous few hours. So I had this proper cartoon moment of rubbing my eyes and being like, Huh? What? Noise complaint? I wake up a wee bit, then tell the nice lady I don't know what she's on about, and then I'm pretty sure if there were any random loud noises coming from the same floor, they'd have probably woken me up. After all, I was knackered, but I wasn't comatose. I think I was just too tired for the significance of the questions to even register, but throughout the course of the call, the lady asked three times if there was anyone else in the room with me. With hindsight, it was almost like they were sure there was someone else there and they were just trying to catch me out or something. It was really bizarre. But like I said, I'm just absolutely exhausted, so within a few minutes of the call ending, I'm back in the land of Nod. I wake up the next morning at about 4am, sleeping pattern only partially screwed up from the jet lag and drag myself into the shower. It's only then, once the hot water and steam has awakened my senses a little, that I remember the weird noise complaint call that I got. I get dry, get dressed, and then start heading down to what is undoubtedly the best thing ever about Vegas, which is the 24-7 breakfast buffets. But as I'm walking down the corridor to the lift, I slow my pace and start listening out for any noise that might have prompted any kind of complaint. Nothing. It's dead quiet. But then again, the noisemaker could have been asleep by that point. Anyway, I eat a light breakfast check out the gym and pool facilities for a while, exploring the surrounding area, 
generally killing time until I head back to my room at around 8. By that point, the whole noise complaint thing had been playing on my mind for a while, and since the hotel was such a resplendent old place, the last thing I wanted to do was annoy the staff or management. So on my way back, I stop off at the reception and inquire about the complaint. The receptionist told me she couldn't tell me exactly who'd made the complaint, nor which room it had come from. But after me piling on as much British charm as I could, she did reassure me that the complaint hadn't come from any of the rooms on my floor. As it turned out, I was right about being the only one on my floor. No one had been checked in for at least a fortnight by that point, and no one else was due to check into that floor for another week. It's at that point that I profess utter confusion at that situation. If I was the only person on my floor, who had been making all the noise? That's when the receptionist asked me a fourth time if I'd had anyone else staying in the room with me. The first few times prompted nothing but confusion in me, but this fourth occasion gave me a distinct sinking feeling in my stomach. There was more than one person who seemed convinced that I had an unexpected visitor that night, and as much as I wasn't sure how that was, the feeling of fear I got was very, very real. I took to locking my door at all times for the next few nights I stayed there. It definitely freaked me out a bit, not enough for me to change hotels or anything, but it still gave me the creeps. I don't believe in ghosts or anything like that, and as long as I had my door lock, I'd be safe. But the whole incident definitely played on my mind for a while, at least until rehearsals were in full swing. I suppose I'm posting to ask if anyone else has had any similar experiences, or if any hotel staff can clue me into why someone might make a mistake like that. I hope you can all shed some light on this soon. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official. And you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon. And maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And I'll see you again soon.